Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, beginning in verse 36. Hear God's word for us this morning. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? My neighbor, I'm glad we're together again. Oh, Mr. Rogers, every, every afternoon in childhood, I would get off of school and I would get to be Mr. Rogers' neighbor. He called every child in our country his neighbor, and he showed you how sweet it could be to be neighbors with such a gentle, loving, whimsical person. But as I grew up and I became an adult, I realized that you can choose your home. Y'all put some thought into that, right? The layout, the size, the school district, the countertops you want. Like, you can choose your home with care, but you have no say in who moves next door or across the street. And they're not all Mr. Rogers, are they? <laughs> no. Um, I'm sure we could regale each other with neighbor stories. I will share two, okay, from my time not here in Spicewood. I was living out in Spicewood. I lived there a decade. And I had the best of neighbors and I had the worst of neighbors. So let, let's start with the best, our backyard neighbors, Flo and Larry. Uh, Flo and Larry, the day we moved in, they came over and they welcomed us to the neighborhood and they said that they were, this was a country neighborhood, so they had been there like decades at that point, and they had a pool. Now this is the hill country, so to have a pool in all that rock was quite a thing, and they said, we would love it if your little girls and you would come swim in our pool. And as long as they have you there, you don't even need to call us and ask. You can just, we put a gate, and you can just come through the gate and swim in our pool. I thought they must be kidding, like just being over generous. They were not kidding. They were not kidding. They love to have our girls swim in the pool. All the little chirpy, screaming, fighting, everything the girls did, they declared that that was music to their ears. And they were not lying. They, they have become bonus grandparents to my children. When we travel, we always see all the sets of grandparents, and Flo and Larry, our old neighbors, are some of those grandparents because of how amazingly good they were. But then there was the people next door. The people next door, um, their home became infested with rats. It was the country, right? So, but still, they had rats apparently falling from their fireplace they had rats scurrying across their home. You would open up the pantry and there would be a rat eating Cheetos or whatever, and it wouldn't run away. I mean, it was an infestation. This is the stories we heard. 
But worse than living next to a home that is infested with rats is the fact that somehow these neighbors decided that we were the ones at fault for their rat infestation. We didn't have rats, right? They had rats. It was our fault somehow. And they wanted us to pay over $10,000 to have their rats removed and the damage that the rats had caused, which was extensive, repaired. Well, we kindly told them we would help them with whatever they needed, but we couldn't and wouldn't pay that amount of money. So they filed on our home insurance a bogus claim trying to get our home insurance to pay for their rat problem. Which then we had to spend hours of time refuting and being like, okay, I mean, our insurance knew, but still, you have to spend hours. The best of neighbors, right? And the worst of neighbors. You have stories too, don't you? Yeah, you do. We all do. Because we can choose our homes, but we cannot choose the people next door or across the street. We cannot choose or dictate their behavior or lack of it, right? Their bad behavior. But our faith and our Lord tells us there is a choice we can make. And that is how we treat them. How we treat those neighbors is central to our faith. Jesus is asked this amazing question. He's asked to take the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Okay, that's the 10 commandments, and that's all of the commandments God gives the people. That is the scripture in his day. And then a teacher of the law says, which is the most important? Whoo! I'm glad that question didn't come up in our Q&A, right? Which is the most important? Although, now I have Jesus' answer. He says, listen, it's not one but two. You love God with everything you are and everything you have. And you love your neighbor like you love yourself. He says everything in scripture comes down to these two things, God and neighbor. And I love that in our church, we embrace the importance of this. Our mission statement, right? We are a faith family. We're a family growing in faith, right, to God. We're growing in love of God for all, right? We didn't put an asterisk and say, but not the bad neighbors, right? Just the good ones, right? For all, serving all. That's the second commandment that Jesus said was so important. That's who we are as a people. We are to love God with all we are, and we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And being where we are, in the community where we live, we realize the broadness of who a neighbor is. Neighbors are people who live here full time. And neighbors are also people who have a home in a different state. And neighbors are also people who worship with us online, 60 to 70 every week from around the country. All of us, no matter where we live, are neighbors because of our love for God and because of the calling of Christ. We realize living here on the border, if we're here, that some of us are close to the church, our commute is a few minutes, others of y'all, you tell me you drive 20 minutes, 30 minutes to come here. You come from different towns, right? Then we have folks hundreds of miles away. Some of y'all grew up speaking English at home, others Spanish, others a whole different language. We have this wide variety of beauty in our congregation and in our community, and they're all our neighbors. We realize that we have neighbors in the colonias who are struggling to make ends meet. We realize that we have neighbors driving down the street, coming back from therapy, having just lost their child. We have neighbors that are just passing by. They're our neighbors too. We want to show them love as much as we can. We realize that not all of our neighbors think or behave or live the same way, but they are all our neighbors. All of them. For all, we say. And that's as Jesus would have it. Right? Because in the beginning, all the, all the rest of the people listening thought, hmm, I wonder if there's an asterisk by neighbor, right? Just the good ones. Just the ones without the rats, right? Just those. The easy ones, I'll love them, Jesus, right? And somebody asks a clarifying question. Well, Jesus, 
who is my neighbor? Like, narrow it down a little bit, right? You narrow down the commandments, narrow down the neighbor. And Jesus refuses to. In fact, he broadens it. Jesus says a neighbor is not just the people living next door, but it's even the people we would consider an enemy. That we are to treat with love, which is not a feeling, it's an action. Jesus tells a story, many of us know it, of a man who is on his way to Jerusalem. He's Jewish. His listeners, Jesus' listeners, are Jewish. This is one of them. And this poor man, he's attacked by bandits, he's beaten, he's robbed, he's left for dead. He needs help. And in Jesus' story, along comes a priest. But the priest pretends not to see the man and continues on to Jerusalem. Well, then along comes a scribe, which is like a Bible commentator, right? This is a really learned person. And there's this hurt man, one of the family of God, right? But this scribe just, mm, right? There's no action of love. And then finally, along this road, comes a Samaritan. Talk about, in the Jewish mind, a nation infested with rats, right? Samaria. And Samaria did not like Israel either. They didn't like each other. They considered each other enemy. And here is the Samaritan walking down the road. He sees this Jewish man who should be his enemy. And he kneels down. And he takes care of him. He puts him on his donkey. He gives his resources so the man could be healed. And so Jesus is reminding us, and then he says to the crowd, so which one of those people act like a neighbor? They're like, oh, it's the Samaritan. He says, go and do likewise. Even those who we consider to be our enemies, we are to treat with love. We are to live it out. That is who we are as God's people. That is our calling from Jesus, to love God and then to love our neighbors, all of them. Now, when I, when I preach this, I know all of us go, oh, that's so hard. And we immediately think of the hardest person to love, right? You've been thinking, oh, I hope she doesn't mean that person, right? And sometimes you come up to me after worship and say, well, Pastor Laura, what about this person? Or what about this? How do we love Hitler? How do we do that? He's horrible, right? Well, the way that we do that is we practice by loving the people near us who are hard to love, and even those who aren't hard to love. In fact, Jesus expands neighbor to be so broad that it's even people I think are my enemies. But he also definitely does still mean what James said here, is neighbors are the people living next door. And because you are living next door to them, they have a chance to interact with you day after day, month after month. The witness of love you can give is profound. And that's, quite frankly, very exciting. Because studies show that, like, more than 50% of our nation don't have a church home. They might be curious about God. They might want to know. They might hit a bump in their life, and they're looking for someone who seems to have a solid rock. And right next door is a neighbor whose name they know, who loves them, who brings them something. We're going to talk about this in a minute, right? They could ask you. There are thousands of people in this community who will never come hear me preach, never come hear Pastor John preach, never have the courage to be in this church because they might think, oh, they're going to get judged or something. But maybe you live next door. And so the minister that God has on your street is you. Do you hear me? The pastor on your street is you. And thank goodness Jesus doesn't say, here are the two commandments. Love God with all you are and evangelize your neighbors. Right? It wasn't that, right? What does Jesus say? Love them. We can all do that. All we need to do is love them. That is the heart of our faith lived out in the world. So I want you to pull out this, who is my neighbor? The sheep. 
And if you're online with us, then you can make your own. You're going to see it in a second. It's easy. It's nine squares. The house in the center, the free square, we will say, is you. Okay? That's your house. The people on the top, the top row is the people across the street. The bottom row is the people who live behind you. And the two on the sides are your next-door neighbors. Now, I know some of y'all back up to a green belt or live on a cul-de-sac or you've got a wall behind you, so, or you live in an apartment. Get creative, okay? But think of who these eight boxes are for you and your home. Get creative. If you live out on acreage, get creative, okay? Then I want you to take this home and see if you can fill it out, okay? This is kind of a start for where we are right now in loving our neighbors and where God wants us to go. You're going to put down three lines. Here they are. So you might want to take, take notes so you can see how far you can get in this. And you'll be interested to see how far other Christians get. Line one, do you know their names? Okay. Do you know their... Love has to begin with just knowing somebody's name, right? Do you know their names? Line two, for every house, do you know something about these folks that you wouldn't know from standing in the street? Something a little bit more about them. Okay, line three... Do you know something deeper? Something about their hopes or their dreams, a struggle they're going through, something in their past. Do you know something meaningful in their life? So I want you to take this home and see how you do. Okay? And I want you to bear in mind that when Christians around the country and Christians around the country have done this, only 10% of believers can fully fill out line one. So 90% of us can't finish line one. Okay? Line two, only 3% can tell you something about their neighbors that they wouldn't know from the street. And this is Christians. Okay? And then when you get to line three, do you know something more about them? Less than 1% will know that thing, a dream or a hope or a struggle that they're going through. So what I want you to do with this is just take it as a starting point, put it on your fridge or put it inside of a cabinet, and then get to know those people that God has placed you in the midst of. You are God's witness. You are the one that will love them. Get to know them. This is fun. You, um, some of y'all are amazing cooks or you grill amazing things, or you bake, make a little extra, and take it to a neighbor when you do. Hey, I made a little extra. Here's some for you. I happen to know that this works because I have a neighbor who did this for us, okay? I'm an early to bed kind of a person. I go to bed, even though my kids laugh at me, around 9 or 9.30 because I'm up at 5 or 5.30, so I'm, I'm in bed early. And one night, very late like 9.30, ungodly hour of the night, right? The doorbell rings. Ding dong. And Kevin and I, I can't remember if we were in the bathroom or we're already sitting in bed reading, we look at each other in horror. Who could this be? It's probably Amazon. It'll probably just go away. Like, we're sure hoping it will. Ding dong. It rings again. Oh, no, we're thinking. There's actually somebody out there who wants to talk to us. What are we going to do? It rings again. We're like, all right, fine. We've got to go answer the doorbell. So we, you know, get ourselves together and we open the door. Because who rings the doorbell at 930? <laughs> and there on the doorstep is a man I've never seen before, because we are new in the neighborhood, with a plate of food. Okay? All of these grilled meats, quesadillas, uh, chiles rellenos, like amazing. And he's got the biggest smile and he says, hello. I'm your neighbor, Mario Sepulveda, and I was grilling, and I had extra, and I brought it to you. Okay, that changed the story, right? All of a sudden, we're like, Mario, come on into our house. You're our best friend. Um, all the kids come out of their rooms. What's going on, right? Mario Sepulveda. I could tell you his name from here to eternity. He'd be like, you can remember it by Super Mario, right? So cute. Any time the doorbell would ring at 9.30, 10 o'clock, we'd be like, oh, it's Mario. And we'd run to the door and we'd get the food that Mario was sharing with us, right? Now, friends, pick a better time than 9.30 at night, okay? But 
even if you go at 9.30 at night, if you have something delicious, you will be welcomed. You, no one will, will be angry at you, okay? If you pick a better time, even better, right? Maybe you say that you're not a cook or you don't grill. Um, what I did for Mario is I have a garden, and I had buku tomatoes one year, that first year I moved here, and I just took them to all my neighbors. I rang the doorbell, I have tomatoes, right? It helps me get to know my neighbors. Um, maybe you knit, maybe you work with wood, maybe you're handy. I have another neighbor, Rolando, we have a WhatsApp, and people were talking about sprinklers that go into the street, right? Gotta stop this, sprinklers that go into the street. Well, Rolando goes, neighbors, I understand how to set your sprinklers, and I will come help you for free if you need help with your sprinklers. I was like, beep, beep, beep. Rolando, hi. It's Laura, I'm your neighbor, and I need your help, right? So if you have something like that, and you do, use that to get to know the people around you. Take walks, right? Sit in your front lawn. And when people pass by, tell them hello. Smile at them. That's love, right? Give them your name. 90% of us are only faking it when we pretend to know our neighbor's name, right? 90% of us don't know the name, but we're faking it. So give them your name and then say to them, if you don't know their name, I'm so sorry. I know you've told me your name and I have the worst memory. Could you tell it to me again? And they'll give it to you and you run in and write it on the list, okay? <laughs> then you won't forget, right? Write it down, that's who lives there. Then when you see them again, you can say, oh, hello, Mario. Oh, hello, Ro Rolando, right? Beginning to love our neighbors begins with knowing their names and then knowing something about them. That is the ministry area, your home, one of them, where God has placed you. And we remember, as we love our neighbors, we are living out what Jesus said was one of the greatest commandments. Right? One of two, we're living that out. It reminds me of a friend of mine who pastors in St. Louis. Um, as you know, St. Louis is a city that has a lot of problems. Um, it struggles a lot. And all of the pastors and all of the faith leaders were meeting with the mayor of St. Louis. And they were having this meeting about their town and about what they could do when one of the pastors asked, Mayor, if you could say one thing that we as leaders, faith leaders, could do that would change this city, what would it be? And the mayor thought about it, and then he said, teach everyone in your congregations to be a good neighbor. And that can change our city. That's after all what Jesus said, isn't it? He said our faith, all of our faith can be summed up into loving God and loving our neighbors, all of them. You are in that home, in that apartment, you are in that RV for a reason. God has people all around you, in the back and on the sides and in the front, who you can be a witness to, a witness of love. Friends, when you do this, it changes the place where you live. Pours in God's love to that place. And look around at the hundreds who call this church home. When all of us do this on our blocks, on our streets, on our cul-de-sacs, in our RV parks, when we all love our neighbors, that just might change the world. Jesus thought it would. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love you and you love us. And maybe we've never thought about it, but you put us in that home, in that RV, in that place, in that apartment. And the people next to us are the ones that we can show your love, unconditional love to, day after day. Help us to grow in knowing our neighbors so that we can grow in the love that we are able to show them. Thank you, Jesus, for telling us what matters most and help us to be faithful in living it out. 
In your amazing name we pray. Amen.